All right, welcome back. Let's start with this derivative right here. We have the derivative of x plus three divided by x minus three. Now, the first thing that we always do when we are using our quotient rule to take derivatives is identify what our numerator function is and our denominator function. And you'll notice that we have our quotient rule right here to reference as we go through these problems. And in this case, our numerator function is x plus three and our denominator function is x minus three. So in this case, x plus three would be our f of x and x minus three would be our g of x. So just keep that in mind as we go about this derivative. But this will be equal to our denominator function, x minus three, times the derivative of the numerator or the top. So we're gonna have the derivative of x plus three and that's going to be one. The derivative of x is one and the derivative of three is zero. So one plus zero is one. And then we're going to subtract the numerator function, x plus three, multiplied by the derivative of the denominator function, which in this case would be one as well, because the derivative of x is one and the derivative of negative three is zero. So once again, we have one because zero wasn't going to change that result. So we'll have one. And then this will all be divided by our denominator squared. So we'll have x minus three squared. So now we can simplify. We are going to have x minus three minus this quantity x plus three, but I'm going to distribute this negative through each part. So we'll have minus x minus three, and this will all be over x minus three squared. And then I'll see that we have this positive x and this negative x that are going to cancel out. And then we can add our negative three and our other negative three. So this will be equal to negative six divided by x minus three squared and that would be the answer to our derivative of this function. Next, let's look at the derivative with respect to z of z cubed divided by sine z. And once again, let's quickly identify what our two functions are that we are taking the quotient of, right? We have z cubed as our top function, our numerator, and we have sine z as our denominator function or our bottom function. And these will each correspond to our f of x and g of x in our formula. So the derivative here is going to be equal to our bottom function, sine z multiplied by the derivative of the top, which is the derivative of z cubed, which will be three times z squared. Then we will subtract that top function, which will be z cubed times the derivative of the bottom, which is the derivative of sine z, which in this case is going to be cosine z because the derivative of sine is cosine. So when we do the quotient rule, you just start with your denominator, multiply it by the derivative of the top, and then you subtract your top multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. And then you divide by your denominator, which would be sine z squared. And so now we can simplify, and this is going to be equal to three z squared sine z minus z cubed cosine z divided by sine squared z. And so in this case, that is our final answer. That would be the derivative of our function here, z cubed divided by sine z. Next, let's look at the derivative of y equals 5x divided by the square root of x minus one. And of course, we wanna know y prime, which is the derivative in this case. And once again, we have to use our quotient rule because we have a function 5x divided by another function, the square root of x minus one. So 5x would be our f of x and the square root of x minus one would be our g of x. So let's use the quotient rule and take this derivative. We'll have that y prime is equal to our denominator function, square root of x minus one, multiplied by the derivative of our top function. So that's just going to be five since the derivative of 5x is five. So then we will subtract our top function, 5x, and we're going to multiply that by the derivative of our denominator, which in this case, we could rewrite that square root of x to be x to the one half power, which allow us to take that power rule derivative a little more easily in terms of visualization. So then we're going to have that the derivative is going to be the derivative of this minus the derivative of one, which we know is just going to be zero. So really it's just the derivative of x to the one half power. So we will have one half times x to the negative one half power, since we would be subtracting one from our power. So we'd have one half minus one, which leaves us with negative one half. And then this will all be divided by our denominator squared, which if we remember its original form would be the square root of x minus one squared. So now let's simplify. We'll have that this is equal to five times the square root of x minus five minus 
five halves, right? I'm taking this one half and multiplying it by this five, and then we'll multiply our variables together and we'll add their exponents, right? So x to the first power times x to the negative one half power is just going to give us x to the positive one half power because one plus negative one half would be positive one half. So then we'll have x to the one half power. And then this will still be divided by that same denominator of the square root of x minus one squared. And before we simplify next, we'll notice that this x to the one half power here would also just be the square root of x. So I'll change that here. We'll have the square root of x. And then we can combine five times the square root of x and our negative five halves times the square root of x. And we'll find that that's going to be equal to just positive five halves times the square root of x. So then our final simplification would be equal to five halves times the square root of x minus five divided by the square root of x minus one squared. And that would be our final answer or our derivative to our original function up here. Next, we're gonna look at the derivative with respect to y of y to the fourth power plus six y divided by seven. Now this one's a little tricky because when you're first learning the quotient rule, your first instinct as soon as you see a fraction is to just use the quotient rule immediately. But you might actually waste some time and do a little bit of unnecessary work if you don't first look at what your two functions that you're dividing are. In this case, we have y to the fourth power plus six y divided by just a constant seven. So we don't really need to use the quotient rule here because there's no variable that we're taking a derivative of in our denominator function. So what we can do is we can redefine our function here and write that the derivative with respect to y is equal to one seventh times y to the fourth plus six times y. And that would be the same thing. It's just this function divided by seven. So we can pull that one seventh out and now we can just take a derivative of this using our power rule. So in this case, this will be equal to one seventh times four times y to the third power. That would be the derivative of y to the fourth, right? We multiply by our exponent and then subtract one from our exponent. And then we'll have plus six because the derivative of six y would just be six. And then we can simplify by writing four y cubed plus six divided by seven. We just put that seven back underneath this quantity. And that would be our answer to the derivative of this function. We didn't need to use the quotient rule here because because there were no variables in our denominator. We could write it in a more simplistic form that allowed us to use an easier rule, or more specifically, the power rule. So next, if you watched our lesson, you know that we used the quotient rule to prove some of our derivative rules for trigonometric functions. We've already looked at tangent x and cosecant x, but let's look at cotangent x here, and let's use the quotient rule to prove that the derivative of cotangent x is equal to negative cosecant squared x. And you might be thinking, well, there's no quotient here. How are we going to use the quotient rule? Well, you can actually redefine cotangent x so we can have the derivative with respect to x of cosine x divided by sine x, right? That's one of our trig identities is that cotangent x is equal to cosine divided by sine. So now we have a quotient of two functions and so we can use our quotient rule. So let's do that. We're gonna have that this is equal to our denominator function sine x multiplied by the derivative of our numerator function cosine. So we'll have the derivative of the cosine which is negative sine x and then we're gonna subtract the top function or our numerator function cosine x multiplied by the derivative of the denominator, which in this case is sine x, so the derivative of sine x would be cosine x. All right, and then our final step is to divide by the denominator function squared. So we'll have sine x squared. So now we can simplify. We'll have that this is going to be equal to negative sine squared x minus cosine squared x, and this will be divided by sine squared x. Now this part can be a little tricky because now how do we simplify this any further? Well, one of our trig identities that we know is that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to one. However, in this case, we have a negative sine squared x minus cosine squared x. But if we were to pull out that negative, then we would have our identity. So let's do that. We'll have that this is equal to negative sine squared x plus cosine squared x divided by sine squared x. And then that's going to give us one, right? That would be our trig identity right here. So this will be equal to negative one divided by sine squared x. And if you remember, cosecant x is equal to one over sine x. So now this can be rewritten to negative 
cosecant squared x. So that's how we prove that the derivative of cotangent x is equal to negative cosecant squared x. Next, let's prove that the derivative of secant x is equal to secant x tangent x by using our quotient rule here. We can redefine secant x to be the derivative of 1 over cosine x because secant is equal to 1 over cosine. So now we have a quotient here, 1 divided by cosine x, that we can use our quotient rule for. Our numerator function is 1 and our denominator function is cosine x. So let's take our derivative. We'll have that this is equal to our denominator function cosine x multiplied by the derivative of the top function, which in this case is going to be 0 because the derivative of 1, a constant, will be 0. Then we're going to subtract our top function 1 multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. So the derivative of cosine is going to be negative sine x. And then this is going to be all divided by the denominator squared. So we'll have cosine x squared. So now let's simplify. This will be equal to 0 because cosine times 0 is going to be 0. And then this negative and this negative will become positive. So we'll have plus sine x divided by cosine squared x. So then we're going to have sine x divided by cosine squared x. And now this part is maybe the trickiest part, is knowing how to split this up so that we can find our form of secant x tangent x. Well, we can split this up into two fractions multiplied together. So we'd have 1 over cosine x multiplied by sine x over cosine x. And that allows us to now define secant, which is 1 over cosine, and tangent, which is sine x divided by cosine x, right? If we were to multiply these two fractions together, we would get this back. We'd have sine times 1 is sine and two cosine functions, so it would be cosine squared. So we are allowed to split this up in order to redefine it. And then finally, this is equal to secant x times tangent x. And that is how we show that the derivative of secant x is equal to secant times tangent x. Finally, let's look at one more example here, except this time we're not going to have that quotient rule up here in the corner for us to reference if needed. In fact, let's try and do this one without looking at it at all and just trying to remember what it is as we take our derivative. So in this case, we have the function x cubed plus 3x minus 2 divided by x squared minus 4, and we want to know the value of the derivative at x equals 1. So let's start by just taking our derivative of our quotient here. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to the denominator function x squared minus 4 times the derivative of our numerator function, which in this case will be 3x squared. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared plus 3, and then that's going to be it because the derivative of 3x is just 3, and the derivative of negative 2 would be 0. Then we will subtract the numerator function x cubed plus 3x minus 2 times the derivative of the denominator function, which in this case is just going to be 2x. So the derivative of x squared is 2x and a derivative of 4 or negative 4 is 0. So we'll just have 2x. And then this is all going to be divided by the denominator squared. So we'll have x squared minus 4 squared. Now, maybe you want to go through and simplify this, but since we're just plugging in a value of 1 here, I think it's just easier to plug 1 into everywhere we have an x and then evaluate it from there. However, if we were just looking for the derivative of this function, our answer here would be an acceptable answer, although you could go through and simplify it if you wanted to. So if we were to plug in 1, if we had f prime of 1, this would be equal to 1 squared minus 4 times 3 times 1 squared plus 3 minus 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 minus 2 times 2 times 1 all divided by 1 squared minus 4 squared. Now, if you were to plug that into your calculator, or I guess you could do it by hand, it wouldn't take too long to do that, you would find that this would equal negative 22 ninths. And so if you want to go through and check my work on that, feel free to do that and make sure that you can get this answer yourself. So that would be the value of the derivative of this function at the value x equals 1. All right, so that's all I had for this example video. Hopefully all these examples were helpful to see how to use the quotient rule to take derivatives of functions. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will get around to those. But if you don't have any questions, that's all I have for now. So I will see you next time.